All right, everyone, it's 11 o'clock. I am going to get started with a few housekeeping measures. I apologize to those of you who have heard this twice already this morning, but for those of you who haven't, welcome to the Lumsden McCormick Annual Exempt Organizations Conference. My name is Christine Prugjib, and I will serve as your host for the webinar today. Before we get to introductions, our housekeeping items. This webinar will be recorded, and once available, it will be posted to the Lumsden McCormick website. Additionally, a link to the slide deck for any presentations we are permitted to share will also be there as well. Both chat and Q&A are enabled. Please make sure to add your questions for the panelists in the Q&A box. We'll be answering questions at the end of the presentation as time allows. We are offering one hour of CPE credit for each webinar. Therefore, all polling questions must be answered. There will be four polling questions throughout the presentation, and CPE certificates will be emailed from support at prolera.com within 30 days. The subject line will read Lumsden McCormick CPE certificate. At the end of the webinar, please create excuse me, please complete the webinar survey. It will automatically launch in your browser. The survey will serve as the webinar evaluation and is required for your CPE credit. Additionally, the Prolera email you receive with the CPE certificate will also contain a webinar evaluation. This evaluation is optional to complete. However, we always appreci appreciate your feedback. And for future webinars, including tomorrow's sessions, please remember to log in using your full name, both first and last. Any questions related to housekeeping items, please leave a message in the chat. Now moving on to our webinar. I am pleased to introduce to you Bob Torella. Bob is a principal in the Audit and Assurance Division, and he works with nonprofit entities and commercial businesses. Bob, I will turn it over to you. Thanks, Christine. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Amy Duffin. Uh, she brings more than 15 years of professional audit experience. She currently serves as the Assurance Technical Director for the not-for-profit industry with the CPA firm BDO USA. To name a few, her areas of expertise include government cost principles, revenue recognition, internal control policy, net asset testing, and compliance audit for nonprofits. And with my it's my pleasure, and I'll turn it over to you uh, to get started now, Amy. Thanks a lot, Bob. Thanks everybody for allowing me to join you today and, and talk about a, a topic that is hopefully top of mind for everybody, which is CECL. And we'll talk a little bit about CECL for, for our nonprofit uh, organizations. <clears throat> so we'll head back here to the agenda for today. <clears throat> we'll spend some time today going over what is CECL, what's the scope of CECL, then we're gonna hit the major changes uh, that are applicable to our nonprofit organizations and all organizations for that matter related to CECL. We'll go through an example for you to help uh, illustrate the points that we'll talk about today. Uh, we'll also talk about some uh, implementation areas and, and things to think about as you implement this standard. <clears throat> and then there are some recap slides at the end of this presentation, which we may not have time to go through today, but you will be provided with uh, these slides, <clears throat> as Christine mentioned, so they'll be available to you and you can uh, read through those as they provide some good details and some, some additional information that you may find help, helpful as you, uh, as you implement this standard. So without further ado, <laughs> we'll talk about what is CECL. Um, hopefully you've heard of it. Uh, CECL, is the current expected credit loss model. And CECL was actually implemented um, in 2018. It was, that's when the first uh, the official standard came out. So it's been a few years. The, our, the banking entities and public companies have already adopted this standard, uh, but our nonprofits, um, unless they've early adopted, and a lot of private companies as well, uh, this is this we are in the year of adoption uh, in, in calendar year 2023, and we'll talk about that here in a second. The standard has been uh, delayed um, around like the COVID time frame. So it, that's why it may not be on on some organizations radars. It's just kind of been pushed and pushed. And I know for a lot of our nonprofit organizations um, and, and for the auditors as well in the room, you know, we've we've just had some 
accounting standard implementation fatigue. You know, we've got revenue recognition, um, non-financial assets, leases. <laughs> so I'm I'm sorry to be the uh, the bearer of news. I guess I won't say bad news, but news that we've got another standard that we have to implement here, and it's unfortunately it's not optional. Uh, we've we've got to do it. So we're going to talk through it today and hope to give you some um, information about how to go about doing that. So you, you, you might hear it called CECL, you might hear it called credit losses, you might have it here it referred to as topic 326, financial instruments, all talking about the same thing. Um, but ultimately this, uh, this standard was issued to enhance the information that's provided to financial statement users about expected credit losses on financial instruments held by the nonprofit organization or, or entity. And so it's really to make uh, or to provide more decision useful information to the users of the financial statements. And when you when you hear the word expected credit losses, before I keep going here, I think the best way to think about this and the, the a, initial example that kind of comes to everybody's mind is think of your if you've got if you've got trade receivables or accounts receivables on your books. Or, you know, think back, if you don't have that at your nonprofit, think back to accounting class, right? Um, that's uh, what we're talking about here is, is really the allowance for doubtful accounts is now going to be called the allowance for credit losses. And I'm, I'm highly simplifying that. There's a lot of other uh, financial instruments that are measured at amortized costs that apply in this standard. We're going to talk, we'll talk about that. But that's the general uh, idea here is that this standard applies to financial instruments measured at amortized cost of your statement of financial position or your balance sheet. And they all have to be considered under this uh, CECL model. As I mentioned before, there are lots of ASUs issued after the fact, um, some to extend the term, others to clarify certain things within the ASU. The other thing I'll point out here is that uh, assets that are measured at fair value, like under ASC 820, are not uh, included in the CECL analysis. Okay, so let's talk about when we have to implement this standard and how we have to go about doing it. So CECL is applicable for our nonprofit organizations for fiscal years beginning after December 15th, 2022. That's the official FASB language. Uh, so that's going to be out as of 12-31-2023. So if you are a calendar year end, the standard applies for your for your December 31st, 2023 year end. If you're a fiscal year end, if you're a 331, it's going to be 331-24, 630-24, or 930-24 is, is when this standard applies. A little bit of a kicker to this is, um, and, and probably not great news, is that the way that this standard has to be adopted is through a cumulative effect to beginning net assets in the period that you're adopting the standard. So what does that mean? That means that we have to adopt this standard as of 1-1-2023, if you're a calendar year end. I'll be using a calendar year end as an example since that's the one that's here in about 30 days, right? So Essentially, we have to calculate the current expected credit losses um, as of 1-1-2023, and then we have to do it again as of 12-31-2023. So unfortunately, in the year of adoption, we've got to do it twice. Um, in each subsequent reporting period, I'm assuming most of you are you know, just one reporting period at the end of your fiscal year. If you have other reporting periods, like quarterly that, that are external, then of course you have to do it at those periods too, but let's just talk about like a one year end. So year of adoption, 1-1-2023 one, one, at the beginning of the year and at the end of the year, and then each subsequent year would just be at your year end. So you might be thinking, okay, well, what does that mean? Cumulative effect to um, adjustment to opening net assets. So let me use an example to help illustrate how this will kind of work. Um, in reality. So we still, we're, we're going to have to do the, the credit loss analysis as of the beginning of the fiscal year. Or if you think of it, you know, as of the end of the prior fiscal year that, um, 
So in this case, 2022. So let's say, um, let's say the only uh, asset on your on your statement of financial position that Cecil applies to is you've got some trade receivables. And let's say at the end of 2022, your uh, allowance for doubtful accounts for those trade receivables was $100,000. And then let's say you go through the Cecil analysis as of 1-1-2023 1 1 or as of you know 12-31-2022, and you say, okay, if I were to have done my Cecil analysis at the end of last year, what would my allowance for doubtful accounts or now likely to be called allowance for expected credit losses, what would that have been as of uh, as of 1231-2022 or 1-1-2023? And so let's say you go through your analysis and it was 100,000 and now it's 150,000. So once you have that amount, you would credit your allowance for expected credit losses for $50,000 because you're bumping that up and you would debit beginning net assets as of 1-1-2023. So that's how you kind of do it from a, a debit and credit perspective. I often have to think of things in debits and credits to kind of visualize it. So hopefully that's helpful to think about how you have to go about um, implementing this standard. Okay, so we've got our first polling question and this is a fill in the blanks question. So it says, Cecil applies to blank and must be implemented for nonprofit organizations blank. So I'll, I'll pause here and allow for some time. Um, and Christine will keep me straight on, on when we can reveal the answer. <laughs> Hey everyone, I see those responses coming in, so we'll just give it a little bit longer. There's about 11 of you left to answer. Okay, and let's share those results. Okay, great. So the answer is B, CISO applies to all entities and it apply and it has to be implemented for our nonprofit organizations for years beginning after December 15th, 2022. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about the scope of CISO. And we're so essentially what we're going to talk about right now is what kinds of financial assets measured at amortized costs are in. What do we have to do? and which ones are out. So before we get too far into this, what I wanna um, mention here is that contributions receivable and pledges receivable are not included in CECL. So if, if you're an organization that is, that your sole source of revenue here is contribution, uh, contribution revenue, uh, revenue that's measured under 958.605, or if you like to think of it as 2018.08, those uh, related receivables, CECL does not apply. So we can all kind of breathe a sigh of relief uh, on, on that. The key here is when you have a receivable on your books, you have to kind of think to yourself, okay, if I've had this receivable, what's the related revenue for that receivable? And how am I recognizing that revenue? So if the related receivable for revenue, if the revenue is recognized under ASC topic 606, then CECL applies to that related receivable. So think of your trade receivables, or if you've got uh, government contracts and you might have like contract assets, like unbilled receivables, those would be in scope for CECL. So we'd have to do the CECL analysis. But anytime you've got receivables, that are related to revenue that's been recognized under ASC topic 958.605 or the old contribution accounting, right? Like, um, you know, conditional versus unconditional, that's the revenue, your related receivable is not uh, in, in the scope of CECL. The other things you see on this slide that would be in scope for CECL, so we'd have to do the CECL analysis for, would be things like tuition receivables, guarantees, notes receivable, 
Uh, you see here certain lease receivables, but don't panic. That's not your lessee right of use asset. That's on the lessor side. So if you have that um, and you have questions, feel free to reach out after the fact. This slide provides you kind of with a, another way of looking at that list uh, for your financial assets that are measured at cost that would be in scope for CECL. And so what I would encourage organizations to do and, and even, even the auditors in the room is take your client's financial statements, take your own financial statements and say, okay, here's what I know is in scope or out of scope based on the standard, based on these slides. Which of my uh, balance sheet line items am I going to have to uh, do this CECL analysis for? And then we have things that are out of scope for CECL. So we already talked about pledges and contributions receivable. If you have related party loans and receivables between entities under common control, that would not be in scope for CECL. So think about like a, if you've got a foundation and a, and a nonprofit, the foundation's consolidated with a nonprofit and you've got loans receivable between the two, uh, those would not be um, in scope for CECL. You've got anything measured under ASC 20, uh, equity securities, equity method investments, derivatives, all the things you see here on the slide would not be in scope for CECL. All right, so let's kind of jump into some of the major changes um, under CECL in comparison to what we have now. Uh, we often kind of have referred to what we have now as this incurred loss uh, model for coming up with our, you know, allowance for doubtful accounts. We'll just kind of use that as an example to, to make that uh, top of mind. But really the whole objective here is to reduce the um, amortized cost to what is expected to be collected uh, through this, you know, allowance for expected credit losses. One of the biggest differences between what we've done in the past and, and what we're, we're required to do now is that we're required to estimate these expected credit losses over the entire contractual term of the asset. So what does that mean? So in the in the context of trade receivables, you know, if you've got a if you've got payment terms of 90 days, your contractual term is 90 days. If you have a note receivable that's a five-year note receivable, your contractual term is five years. Or if you've got a five-year note and there's three years left, then your contractual term is three years. We don't factor in any uh, expected extensions into that analysis. We're only looking at the, the contract term as it, as it stands today. Overall, the CECL model is just more of a forward-looking analysis as opposed to Maybe what we've done in the past where we've looked at our allowance for doubtful accounts and we've thought about like, okay, well, what's collectible in the next like 12 to 18 months or whatever, whatever that loss horizon would be. But now again, we're looking at the full contractual period of those, um, of those financial assets that are measured at amortized cost. This slide is, is really the best summary that I think for the changes in the CECL model. And I'm gonna spend a good amount of time on this slide because I think it's a good summary and a good way to visualize what we have to do when we're thinking about coming up with what our expected credit loss is. <laughs> Excuse me. Before I start kind of going through the, the circles on this slide, one of the things that I want to highlight for everybody is really the importance of documentation for this standard. You may end up in a place where you're, again, if we're just thinking about trade receivables here as the example, you may end up in a place where your old allowance for doubtful accounts is not very much different than the new CESOL amount that you come up with. Like if you've historically had an allowance that hovers around just, for example, $100,000, there's nothing in this standard that says, now it has to be a million dollars, or now it has to be zero dollars. It's all based on this analysis that we have to go through, and the key is going to be documenting the analysis as to how we came up with it. Um, I can't stress that enough. Um, it's important to make sure that we are in, you know, 
having our books and records in, in accordance with GAAP, your auditors are going to be asking for the documentation to support how you came up with your expected credit losses, just like they would have for the allowance for doubtful accounts. So as we go through each of these circles, I'm going to kind of be pointing out as we go along what should be documented in those adoption memos. Again, nothing to say that this is going to materially affect your balance sheet, but there are significant disclosures related to CECL that are required. And of course, the analysis is what's key to getting there. The other thing I'll mention before I go through all of these circles and, and how we have to go through the analysis is that the circles are not optional. Each of the circles that we talk about are required to be included in your analysis for your expected, for, um, expected credit losses. Okay, so let's get started with, uh, with our historical loss information circle. And so this is something we're all pretty familiar with. This is where we started before. This is where we're going to start now. And we're going to we're going to consider when we think about our our receivables or uh, the uh, the assets that are measuring amortized costs that we have to go through this with. What has happened historically? So historically, we've had a two percent uh, write off rate. You know, whatever it might be, that's that's where we're going to start, just like we have before. There's two key differences in what we used to do and what we have to do now. And one, which we probably kind of did when we did the like allowance method, but we might not have documented it, is we have to consider what is the historical loss period that we need to that we've decided to consider based on our management judgment. So are we going to use an in inception to date of the receivable balance? Are we going to use the last two years? Are we going to use the last five years? Are we going to exclude COVID because those years are outliers or maybe they aren't? So it's important to document what is the historical loss period that we're going to look at when we're determining that initial kind of loss rate as the base point for starting this analysis. The other big difference uh, with this standard is that the standard requires that you pull your financial assets based on like risk, risk characteristics. So what does that mean? So if we think about uh, trade receivables, again, as an example, you might look at your trade receivables and you might say, all of these receivables have similar risk characteristics. The customers are similar in nature. So I'm going to have one pool of trade receivables. But you might look at your uh, trade receivables and say, well, I have customers that are corporate customers that 99.9% .9 of the time pay me, or I have, and I have individual customers, and they're the ones who oftentimes don't always pay, and that's where I have my, this most significant amount of my write-offs. Excuse me. So the standard requires us to at least go through that analysis. There, again, there's no one saying you have to split them up. There's no one saying you have to have two pools or four pools or 10 pools. It's the really dependent on your organization and the risk characteristics of uh, your particular uh, financial asset that's measured in amortized costs that we're, that we're going through the CISO model for. But again, as we think about documentation here, we've got to document why we came up with that pool and, and why we believe either the risk characteristics are the same for everyone or why we've chosen the pools that we've chosen. And we're gonna have a slide to kind of go through some examples that the standard gives us uh, for what those pools should be or could be. Okay, so next we go to our next circle. And again, remember, none of these are optional. Um, we have to think about current conditions. So what is it about our organization? What is it about our customers that may have changed in relation to our historical analysis or our historical period that we've decided that we may need to factor into this current conditions. For example, maybe we used to have payment terms of 120 days on our receivables and we've reduced that to 60 days. How does that impact your historical information? Do you think people are gonna be able to pay in 60 days? Was Is there a reason why there was 120 days? Like what? 
what about those uh, that risk characteristic or the change in, in the way that the receivables are being collected could qualitatively or quantitatively affect the historical loss rate? Perhaps your customers are pretty status quo and you know you don't have a lot of change and that's okay. Again, there's nothing to say that you have to have a current condition that changes your historical loss information. It's a matter of documenting that you considered it, what your considerations were, and, and why you didn't have an additional um, loss factor to include uh, based on those current conditions. The next circle is probably the hardest one, um, and it's it will be likely one of the harder ones to kind of audit as well on the auditor side. And that's reasonable and supportable forecasts. So again, this is not optional. We have to have some type of economic analysis that we factor into this expected credit loss model to say, what is it about the, the economic environment that would, could impact our uh, allowance for expected credit losses? So if we take trade receivables, for example, you know, Every organization may could use a different economic factor in, in thinking about this. Perhaps one organization looks at inflation. Perhaps another looks at unemployment rate or GDP or whatever it might be, depending on the types of receivables, your types of customers. So you've got to come up with some type of way to forecast what you think might happen and whether that forecast is, is positive, meaning it reduces that historical loss rate. So, you know, unemployment is going down. So I think that's going to help help us in this case. And our historical loss rate is going to be less in, in the coming year or vice versa. Um, so or and, you know, depend if you're an international organization could depend on where you are in the world. Right. So those are the kinds of things that we have to think about when we're thinking about reasonable and supportable forecasts. If we think about longer term receivables, like a five year note receivable, the standard suggests that organizations should be able to forecast at least a year, maybe two years out, right? So we can't really say we can't forecast if we're talking about a trade receivable, for example, we can't really say we can't forecast 90 days. I mean, that's yes, yes, we can, right? Like that's that won't be a valid explanation for not being able to have a reasonable and supportable forecast. However, there we it's there's also reasonability built in here, right? If you've got a five-year note receivable, can we really forecast uh, the next five years? Probably not, maybe, but but maybe not, right? So if your organization has determined that you can reasonably forecast one year out, then when you're um, when you're developing your expected credit loss, you're going to use that forecast for one year out for your expected credit loss. And then if we just hop over to the next circle for a minute, for the remaining four years of that five-year note receivable, you're allowed to revert to history. So it's important to come up with way, a way to reasonably forecast out and what period is reasonable for your organization and why. And then for the remaining period that you cannot forecast, you revert back to your historical, um, you have your historical loss information. And that's really for your longer term receivables. We would not expect to see a reversion to history for your trade receivables, unless for some reason they're long term. One thing I want to point out here is that we cannot simply say we're going to revert to history on everything. That's that's not going to be the case. There always has to be consideration of current conditions, and there always has to be consideration of reasonable and supportable forecasts, because there is a period that you can reasonably forecast, and that remaining period you can revert to history. And then after that is all said and done, we will um, we will be able to calculate our expected credit losses based on that analysis. So I know that that's a lot of uh, information and a lot to digest. Um, and we're going to go through some additional slides to help kind of drive home some of these points. And then we're going to go through an example as well to help 
kind of illustrate how this might work in real life. But again, I just want to reiterate that each of these elements needs to be considered in your analysis. And as you document them, make sure you've got the why behind it. You know, we used on the unemployment rate, why? Why is that relevant for your organization as your reasonable and supportable forecast? We, in order to, in order to forecast for our five-year note receivable, we use a, a, dis, a discounted cash flow model. Why did you do that? And then make sure you show the relevant calculations for how you came up with uh, the forecast information or where you got the data from when you're going through this analysis. Uh, you'll, you'll thank yourself later when your auditors come back to ask for that information. And you'll probably thank yourself later when you go to do this next year and you start to think through, what did I do last year? And how did I calculate that amount? Um, and where did I get that data from? So um, while it is, it's, it's not gonna be a short exercise uh, for organizations that have a significant amount of financial instruments that are measured at amortized cost, uh, I just encourage you to, to make sure that that documentation is, is appropriate. Okay, we've already talked about uh, the majority of this uh, information in the, when we went through the, the bubbles or the circles. The one thing I wanna point out on this slide is the, uh, is the second bullet point where it says, financial assets without similar risk characteristics should be evaluated individually. So if you have, um, if, you have if you're an organization that has a lot of notes receivable, and you have one or two, and, and you can generally pull them together based on um, some type of pooling method, which we'll, we'll kind of give you some more examples here in a second. But you've got like one or two that are that are outliers, and um, you don't want to include them <clears throat> in your historical loss information as a basis because you've been writing things off for them over the years or whatever it might be. You know, if you it, you just kind of have to think about are there outliers, and you want to get those out of the pool and analyze those. Uh, separately. You don't want to get to a point where you're analyzing every single receivable uh, in a pool of notes receivable separately, but just kind of think about are these true outliers because you don't want those outliers to skew the rest of the pool when you're calculating your allowance for expected credit losses. The, there's a, two other things I want to mention. And that's recoveries and write-offs. So when you go to do this analysis, um, you know, let's say you're doing it as of the beginning of your fiscal year uh, for the end of last year, right, for the year of adoption, or you're doing it in subsequent years. And in any given year, you have a lot of recoveries or you have a lot of write-offs that you weren't necessarily expecting to have. In those cases, that, that information needs to be factored into your next period analysis, right? So if now all of a sudden you have a bunch of write-offs, there must be a reason why. And so you've got to factor that in. So, um, you know, if I were if I were auditing your organization, I might say, okay, well, you've got, um, you have significant write-offs from in comparison to last period. How is that factored into your current expected credit loss model? Is it expected to continue? Why or why not? Or the same thing goes the other way. If you've got a lot of recoveries, did we did we overestimate that expected credit loss, and why is that? Did we did we maybe not use the right economic factor? Did we maybe not consider proper current conditions when we went uh, we went through that analysis? So think about where we might have went wrong. Maybe it was just a fluke, uh, but and keep those things in mind as you as you analyze this. Um, allowance for expected credit losses in future periods. This is a nice summary of, of what is, I guess, under the old rules and what, what is going to be under, under the new CECL model. We've talked about all of these things, but just to reiterate, remember we've got to pull the assets or document you know, why we've, how we've considered the pooling we're basing everything on the contractual term of the 
of the receivable or financial instrument, not just like a 12 year outlook. And then we have to go through each of those circles that we went through and, and perform our analysis. The biggest, uh, the biggest thing that I don't think many organizations factored in because we didn't have to when we did our allowance was the, the reasonable and supportable forecasts. Okay, on to polling question number two. What are the elements of the CECL model that organizations must factor into their determination of the allowance for credit losses? Okay, I see those answers coming in. And just a reminder to everyone that to receive your CPE credit for this session, we need to be answering all of the polling questions. We'll give it just a little bit longer here. Okay, and I will share the results. Hey, the answer is C. We have to, those are all those circles that we that we just talked about. Thanks, Christine. All right, so when I talked about pools before, you may also hear this or see it referred to in the standard and elsewhere as uh, pooling. You might see the word portfolio segmentation or you might see the word asset segmentation. They all mean the same thing and these are some of the examples that the standard provides for ways you may consider pooling your financial assets measured uh, amortized costs from a risk perspective. Again, these are just examples. There's nothing to say that you have to use one, two, or three of these or come up with your own based on your organization's uh, risk profile. We talked about things like geographical location, uh, you know, like Customers in the U.S. versus if you've got an office located in Tanzania might be a different uh, might be a different story. Uh, you might look at the collateral type. You might look at uh, the term of the loans that um, are involved in this analysis. So, just some examples of things to think about when you are going through this analysis. All right. Some of, some of our receivables and some organizations may have a receivable balance for which you have never experienced a write-off, and that's fantastic. And so what a lot of people like to try to jump to is like, well, I've never had any historical losses, so can I? it should just be zero now. Like, I have never had an allowance. Why would I have one now? And that's a fair point. I actually recently reviewed a memo for, for one of our clients uh, that is that exact situation just that based on the type of work that they do they've never had a write-off and they probably never will unless something crazy happens and that's okay uh, there is nothing to say that if you had zero losses in the past that now you have to have you now all of a sudden have to have hundred thousand dollars on your books for expected credit losses the thing that you have to keep in mind is that you still have to go through the analysis, right? You still have to document, I considered my historical loss information. Is there anything about what I'm doing currently that has changed that would make that risk of loss not zero? What about uh, economic conditions, right? If I apply, um, you know, in, in relation to my historical loss information, if I apply a percentage to that, does it matter? It's still zero. Um, so it just becomes a matter of, of documentation as to how you got there. Um, and, and again, we can't just say because I've never had one before in, in the history of my receivables. We have to factor in and, and consider those other elements in the circles that we talked about. So again, you could very well have a zero loss if you have before. It's just a matter of documenting how you got there and why that's, uh, why that's a reasonable estimate. All right, disclosures. This is a very high level uh, summary of the disclosures that will be required under CECL. 
Um, they're, uh, the disclosures are a training in and of themselves. Um, it, depending on the types of uh, financial instruments at, at amortized costs that you have on your books, um, will depend on the, the volume of the disclosures that are involved. There are some disclosures that are not applicable to trade receivables that are due in less than one year, which is great. But there are also rather lengthy disclosures that are, would be required when you have a, you know, a portfolio of notes receivable or, or guarantees or things like that. So just kind of keep that in mind as you're going through your analysis because the analysis that we went through and that you're building is going to help you build those disclosure uh, footnotes that are required. What I would encourage you to do is, is talk with your audit uh, auditors and uh, see if they'll give you the section of the disclosure checklist. I know we give, uh, we give our clients a disclosure checklist um, to help them uh, you know, go through these disclosures. There are also examples out there on the internet. Uh, BDO has, if you, if you just Google um, example CECL disclosures BDO or something like that, there's a, a, a booklet that kind of goes through um, an example. It's a banking example, but it, it steps you through what's required and has headers and it, it does help. Um, you know, some of it is not going to apply because it's banking specific, but other things will apply and kind of helps you visualize what those disclosures might look like. Just keep in mind that, you know, you're going to have your typical transition disclosures like you would for any other standard that gets implemented. You've got policy uh, disclosures that you'll have, and then you've got the, the set of disclosures that include both quantitative and qualitative information. So the analysis that you're going through that we've already talked about is going to help with the development of those disclosures. For some of you, it may not be that significant. Again, if you've only got trade receivables, there's a lot of these that uh, don't apply if the trade receivables are due in less than one year. But again, others of you may, um, may be facing some some lengthier disclosures that are added to the financial statements. Um, and unfortunately, you know, some of these some of these financial statements just keep getting longer and longer with you know revenue recognition and lease disclosures and, and now CECL. So I'm sorry to be the, the bearer of more disclosure news, uh, but that that is the case with this with this standard. So let's take some time now uh, to go through an example to help you illustrate all the things that we've been talking about. Because for me, when I when I first went through this, I was like, oh, I just, I just need an example. I need to see this and how it would how it would work in real life. So we're gonna go through a trade receivable example. Um, and hopefully, you know, if, if you've got trade receivables, this will help um, help you think through how we go about doing this. So some of these slides are just nice reminders about what we talked about. Before, we have to keep in mind we have to pull assets with similar risk characteristics. We've got to consider historical loss rate information. We adjust that for current conditions. And then we apply our reasonable and supportable forecast amount to calculate the, the estimated credit loss. And again, this is uh, just a nice summary for things to consider when we're, when we're looking at uh, trade receivables and other receivables for that matter uh, when we're going through the analysis. So let's let's walk through this example. And I'm going to stop and talk about some of these bullet points to help you understand why the information is included in this example and how how and why it's important and, and how it would be included in your um, in your uh, write-up or your memo for implementation. Okay, so this example says Entity E provides services to their members. The members are homogeneous and have the same risk characteristics. Members are provided with payment terms of 90 days. So the what this is trying to tell us is that the organization has trade receivables, they're providing services to their members, and the members have similar risk characteristics. So to me, this is saying, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> To me, this is saying, I'm going to have one pool of receivables for this particular trade receivable because I have similar risk characteristics and my members are, are the same kind of across the board. And that's that's okay. That's, that's what we would document in our memo. 
And then we have got members are provided with payment terms of 90 days. And so that's that's helping us to understand what's the contractual period here. It's also helping us to understand that we're not going to be reverting to history. This is a short term receivable. We've got to go through our all of our circles. Then it's telling us, it's giving us information about the historical loss information for this particular organization. It says Entity E has tracked historical loss information for its trade receivables and it compiled the following historical credit loss percentages. So let's just focus on the first one. As we go through the example, you'll see how the calculation works. So they're saying their historical loss percentage for current receivables is 0.3%. What they did not say in this example is, is what was the historical period that they used? And again, that would be important for you to document and show how you calculated that 0.3% or the 8% or whatever it is in your analysis. So um, your auditors are going to say, well, how did you get 0.3%? Show me, show me where that data came from. All right. So then after we've We've got we've cut the base of historical loss information, and we know we've got one pool. Then we've got uh, entity E believes that his that this historical loss information is a reasonable basis to determine expected credit losses for trade receivables held at the reporting date, because the risk characteristics of its members are similar, and its credit practices have not changed significantly over time. So this bullet point is getting at that current conditions. And the key here is that because the risk characteristics of its members are similar and current, its credit practices have not changed significantly over time. If they had had a significant change in customers or the credit practices had changed, that would be something we would have to factor into that current condition circle when we're, when we're thinking through this analysis. But that's what that's getting at. And that's what we would document in our, in our memo. And we have, however, Entity E has determined that the current and reasonable and supportable forecasted economic conditions have improved. So now we're getting into that reasonable and supportable forecast circle. It's saying Entity E has observed that unemployment has decreased as of the current reporting date, and Entity E expects that there will be an additional decrease in unemployment over the next year. Entity E estimates that the loss rate to decrease by approximately 10% in each age bucket. Entity E developed this estimate based on its knowledge of past experience for which there were similar improvements in the economy. So they're using unemployment data and they're saying they would have done a look back and they would have said, okay, when, when um, unemployment um, decreased, my loss rate decreased. And they would have come up with that percentage by using data. Right, so this is a very simplistic example, but it doesn't have all of like the calculations and things like that. But if you did have, um, if you have this, you know, you would, you would, we would say, how did you come up with ten percent? Right, your auditors would say, show me how you come up with ten percent. What historical unemployment data did you pull? What's the current unemployment data? Uh, why do you think it's going to decrease uh, next year as well? What what kind of information did you use to kind of figure that out? And then we get to how do we calculate this? So you take your aging buckets that you have, and then you're going to apply your, your credit loss rate. And if we stick with that current conditions, right, our historical loss rate, if we go back just for a second, was 0.3%. And we know based on the analysis that was performed that this loss rate de is going to decrease by 10%. And so if we go over here, you've got a loss rate of 0.27%, which is a 10% decrease from 0.3. And then you apply that percentage to your amortized cost of your, your outstanding receivables in that particular bucket, and you come up with your expected credit loss. So that's kind of how this uh, works. I'll say, quote unquote, in real life, um, but a very simplistic example that helps to illustrate how you would go about calculating and thinking through what to document. This is just a, an example of how you might disaggregate and pull the, um, pull the receivables 
you know, in this example, they're pulling it into essentially four pools. So they're saying, okay, well, I have US and world, and I've got different risk characteristics between corporate and others. And so I need to factor that into this analysis. One thing to keep in mind is that this is helpful if you've got, you know, in that in that expected credit loss model, right? You're applying the same percentage to every bucket. So that's why it becomes important to disaggregate if you if there's data that's skewed between, you know, your corporate versus your others or your US versus your world. You don't want to apply this historical loss percentage that's adjusted for current conditions and, and supportable forecasts if it's going to increase your uh, overall expected credit loss unnecessarily. So that's one of the reasons why it's important to think, really think through those pools. Now, the other thing to think about is that when you have those pools, the analysis in this particular case would be done four times. And there are certain disclosures that would have to be shown four times for each pool. So just something to keep in mind as you, as you implement this standard. Okay, uh, we're gonna do polling question three. What are some examples of ways an organization might choose to pool financial assets measured at amortized cost? Okay, great. We see those answers coming in and I'll give it just a few more seconds. Just a reminder to everyone to fill out these polling questions to get your CPE credit. We have about 10 minutes left here in this last session and this polling question and one more. Okay, and we'll share those results. Okay, great. The answer is A. Asset type, size, and geographical location are just some examples of, of ways that an organization can go about pulling their financial assets. Some of these slides, again, will be here for your reference. Um, I'm not going to go through the some of the examples for these other types of uh, financial instruments. I want to get to, um, in the interest of time, I want to get to some discussions for for implementing and planning. And we've already talked about a good amount of this, uh, but just kind of keep in mind as you go and, and implement this, some key takeaways hopefully that you have from today are in the year of adoption, we have to do this twice. We have to do it as of 1-1-2023 if we're a calendar year end. And again, as of 12-31-2023. So if, if you happen to have a 9-30 year end, you're kind of close to the beginning of your the fiscal year of adoption, right? So you would have had to have adopted this at the beginning of your fiscal year, so 10-1, 2023, if you're a 930 year end. So you're still relatively close, so you could get a jump start on that. There's nothing that says you have to wait until year end. It's probably, in fact, easier to get started now if you haven't already. Um, we've got uh, one way to push it through uh, beginning net assets. We've got to have a cumulative effect there. Keep in mind that the key here is documentation. Again, your balance sheet uh, or your statement of financial position may not change significantly from a dollar's perspective. Your allowance for credit losses might not be too much different from your allowance for doubtful accounts, uh, but it's the analysis that we have to go through and document to make sure that we are uh, including the proper disclosures and make sure our financial statements are in accordance with this, uh, this new accounting standard. Have a conversation with your auditors about, you know, materiality. Uh, materiality isn't necessarily based on the allowance of dollar amount. It's based on the receivable balance um, and risk characteristics that that the organization has. Um, so it's important to um, not simply write this off as immaterial if you have no allowance for doubtful accounts because it's it's not necessarily immaterial and there's still disclosures that would be required. So have that conversation with your auditors. Uh, get a jump start on the disclosures. Um, and if you have complex receivables, um, like if you've got a lot of notes receivables or guarantees, this is definitely gonna be a heavier lift than if you only have some trade receivables and uh, you know contributions receivable with just scoped out. 
So have a, again, talk to your auditors. Um, they cannot implement the standard for you. That would be an independence issue. And they can't make management judgments for you as well. A lot of this is management judgment. But you can, if you really need help and it's, it's overwhelming, you know, there are, there are consulting firms that can help you um, implement this. And I'm sure your, your auditors can recommend someone if you need help in that implementation process. The biggest challenge is like that is the forecast circle. That's the hardest part for many organizations um, and, the, and the documentation and management decisions that are made in the process are challenging um, and just take time to, to document and think through. All right, let's do our last polling question. Which of the following financial statement items are not scoped in for Cecil? Great, and while everybody answers this last polling question, just a reminder, if you do have any questions for Amy, please feel free to add those in the chat. Even if she's not able to get to them today, she can get back to you after today's presentation with any questions you may have. So again, please don't hesitate to let us know if you have any questions. Okay, and here are those results. Great. The answer is pledge and contributions receivable are scoped out. Notes receivable are scoped in. So if you have notes receivable, I saw a few responses there. If you have notes receivable, those are scoped in for CECL. So the CECL would apply to your notes receivable. So I just want to thank you all for allowing me to join you today. Uh, the remainder of these slides, as I mentioned before, are nice little recap question and answer slides that you can read through at your leisure uh, once the slides and the presentation are posted. Um, but again, feel free to reach out with any questions. My email address will be included on the slides as well. Happy to try to answer. I'm not going to pretend to be a CECL expert, but we have others in the firm, and I'm sure your audit firms do as well, that you that you use who <coughs> are excuse me, our official experts at, at CECL. So, <clears throat> excuse me, I wish you all the best in implementing this standard and, and getting your documentation in line and your disclosures done. Um, so all the best in, in, implement, in implementing. <laughs> Thank you very much for allowing me to join you today. Great. Thank you again, Amy, for joining us. And everyone, I would just like to remind you, when you close out of this session, there will be a survey that populates in your browser. So please complete that. And we look forward to seeing everyone again tomorrow for our second day of the conference. Have a great day, everyone.